Welcome to the Learn Pediatrics module on the newborn exam. In this module, we'll be reviewing the examination of the newborn. We do this exam just after birth, prior to discharge from hospital, and at regular intervals throughout the first few months of life. Initial examination of the newborn should be done as soon as possible after delivery. This ensures early detection of any abnormalities and establishes a baseline for subsequent examinations. As with all physicals, it is important to properly position both yourself and the patient. For the newborn exam, you should ensure that the ambient temperature is warm enough to allow for the infant's comfort while being exposed. Often, keeping the entire room warm is difficult. Using an examining table with a built-in warmer is quite useful. While having a routine order of procedure in the examination of the infant makes less likely the omission of any essential part of the examination, your routine should be flexible. If the infant is quiet and relaxed when first approached, auscultation of the heart and palpation of the abdomen can precede more disturbing examinations, such as the mouth and hips. At the time of delivery, the infant's APGAR score should be recorded. The components of the score are color, heart rate, reflex irritability, muscle tone, and respiration. It should be documented at one and five minutes after birth. If the five-minute APGAR is less than nine, further recording should be made at five-minute intervals until the newborn is clinically improved. Once you've determined that the baby is stable, from an airway, breathing, and circulation perspective, you can begin your systemic exam. It's important that a few exact measurements be made and recorded. These include weight, crown to heel length, and head circumference. These should be plotted on an appropriate centile chart on each visit to allow for early identification of growth problems. Note how active the baby is, and whether the baby's cry is normal. Look for any obvious malformations, dysmorphic facies, or limb abnormalities that may suggest a serious syndrome, such as trisomy 21. Take note of the baby's respirations and effort of breathing. Grunting or labored breathing usually suggests pulmonary pathology, such as respiratory distress syndrome. Most often, the breathing of a newborn is diaphragmatic, so during inspiration, the anterior thorax usually draws inward while the abdomen protrudes. Pay attention to the baby's color. See if there is any pallor, plethora, jaundice, or cyanosis. Acrocyanosis, where the fingers and toes appear bluish, is normal for a newborn infant. If there's generalized cyanosis, observe the response to oxygen administration as well as what happens during crying. In the absence of cardiac disease, the infant should spontaneously pink up over time or with positive pressure ventilation. Very few babies need resuscitation, often just drying, Positioning the baby properly and patience is all that is needed for the infant to breathe and move spontaneously. If more active resuscitation is needed, follow current NRP protocols. In this section, we will go through the newborn examination from head to toe. Skin. Besides the color of the skin, there's some common skin changes or manifestations that you should look for. When the infant is delivered, it is often covered in a cheesy, white covering called vernix. This is completely normal. Occasionally, you may see milia, which are pinpoint white papules on the face that are keratin-filled epithelial cysts. These resolve spontaneously. Look for slate gray patches, which are also known as Mongolian spots. These are bluish patches, usually located on the lumbar and buttock areas. They are commonly found in babies with darker skin. They are normal and become less obvious over time. Birthmarks, such as hemangiomas, salmon patches, and small cafe au lait spots are found on most neonates. Rarely, the presence of numerous or large birthmarks may necessitate an expert dermatologic opinion. The most common rash seen on newborns is a papular eruption known as erythema toxicum. This usually appears on day two or three of life. It resolves spontaneously and requires no treatment. Note 
any petechiae or bruising of the face, which may indicate a traumatic delivery. This can place the infant at higher risk for neonatal jaundice. Head. The infant's head is often molded at birth from being engaged in the vaginal canal. It's not uncommon for the skull bones to overlap each other. Palpate the anterior fontanelle, coronal, sagittal, and lambdoid sutures, and posterior fontanelle. Take note of any trauma to the head, such as caput sexodeum, which is the diffuse swelling crossing suture lines caused by pressure from the uterus or vaginal wall during a vertex delivery. Cephalohematomas, bleeding into the periosteum that does not cross suture lines, may also occur. More concerning would be the presence of a subgaleal hematoma, a fluctuant boggy mass that is movable over the entire scalp. These bleeds are rare, but because bleeding is into the large potential space between the scalp and the periosteum, a large volume of blood can be lost from the circulation. The eyes are most easily examined if opened by the baby itself. This often occurs spontaneously if the eyes are shaded from light with hands or during feeding. Shine a light to elicit the red reflex. Absence of this may suggest congenital cataracts or other intraocular pathology. Look for dysmorphic features, such as the presence of a flattened bridge of the nose, facial asymmetry, or epicanthic folds. Coanal atresia is checked for by seeing if the infant can breathe with mouth closed, and then with left and right nostril occluded alternately. If in any doubt, check nasal airways with a catheter. Infants are obligate nose breathers till four months of age. Ears, which are unusual in size or shape, are floppy or lacking in normal cartilage, and especially if low placed, are of significance and may be associated with urinary tract abnormalities. Universal hearing screening is recommended for all infants using formal audiological testing modalities, such as automated auditory brainstem response or evoked autoacoustic emissions. The mouth should be fully inspected with a good light and spatula. And the palate inspected right back to the uvula to exclude minor degrees of cleft palate. Sternomastoid muscles should be palpated and the range of rotation of the head to each side checked to rule out congenital torticollis. Palpate the clavicles for fractures. Webbing or redundant skin in a female infant suggests interuterine lymphedema and Turner syndrome. Chest. Moving down to the chest, look for any asymmetry of the rib cage. Breast hypertrophy is common in males and females due to transfer of maternal hormones. Listen to the chest to ensure equal air entry to both lung fields. Crackles may indicate infection, respiratory distress syndrome, or transient tachypnea of the newborn, particularly in a baby who is born by cesarean section. Listen for heart sounds and murmurs on both the chest and the back. Transient murmurs are common and often benign. On the other hand, congenital heart defects initially may not produce any abnormal heart sounds. Brachial and femoral pulses should be palpated and their strength and timing compared. Absence of femoral pulses or brachial femoral delay is suggestive of left-sided heart lesions and coarctation of the aorta. It takes practice to feel the femoral pulses. They should be felt using gentle pressure over the inguinal area. Abdomen. Inspect the abdomen for any obvious defects. The umbilical cord should have three vessels, two arteries, and one vein. Finding a variation from this should prompt formal renal assessment by ultrasound. The abdominal wall is usually weak, especially in preterm infants. Therefore, diastasis recti and 
umbilical hernias are not uncommon. A scaphoid abdomen suggests diaphragmatic hernia, while abdominal distension suggests obstruction, often due to meconium ileus. Following inspection, palpate for internal organs. The liver is normally palpable as much as two centimeters below the costal margin. Less commonly, the spleen tip may be felt. The kidneys, especially the right, can often be felt on deep palpation. Genitalia. Now we will move on to the genital examination. Inspect that the infant does not have ambiguous genitalia. In a newborn female, the labia majora are prominent. Non-purulent discharge is a normal phenomenon. A whitish or pinkish-red discharge can be present secondary to transfer of maternal hormones. Ensure that there is no clitoromegaly, that is, the enlargement of the clitoris beyond one centimeter in size. In the male infant, the normal scrotum is relatively large. Both testes should be descended into the scrotum. Any scrotal swelling can point to the presence of a hydrocele or hernia. A penile length of less than 2.5 centimeters is indicative of micropenis and should be investigated. The prep use of the newborn is normally tight and adherent, and erection of the penis is common and bears no significance. Most infants void within a 12-hour period, and by 24 hours, 95% of newborns will have passed urine. Check that the anus is in a normal position and is patent. An imperfect anus is not always visible and may require evidence obtained by gentle insertion of the little finger or a rectal tube. A sacral dimple caused by an irregularity of a skin fold is often present in the sacrococcygeal midline and may be mistaken for an actual or potential neurocutaneous sinus. Concerning features would include a dimple that is higher on the back than the tip of the sacrum, tufts of dark hair overlying the dimple, or actual visualization of a fluid-filled meningocele. Meconium should be passed within the first day of life. Passage of meconium beyond the first 24 hours of life warrants investigation. Musculoskeletal. In examination of the musculoskeletal system, deformities observed in the infant are often due to the way the fetus was positioned in utero or due to the presentation and trauma of delivery itself. Spontaneous symmetric movements of the extremities should be observed. Absence of this may indicate nerve damage or fractured bones. Hands and feet should be examined for polydactyly, syndactyly, and abnormal dermatoglyphic patterns, such as a single palmar crease. The feet should be examined for evidence of talipes equinoveris or club foot, where the feet are permanently inverted at the ankles. A large gap or deep crease in between the first and second toe can indicate possible Down syndrome. The hips of all infants should be examined with specific maneuvers to rule out congenital dislocation. In the Barlow maneuver, the hips are flexed and the thighs adducted. Apply force posteriorly in line of the shaft of the femur in the attempt to dislocate the femoral head from the acetabulum. Dislocation is confirmed by the Ortolani maneuver, where the dislocated hip is reduced back into the acetabulum. The hips and knees again are flexed with the thumbs on the medial aspect of the baby's knee, while the index finger is placed over the greater trochanter. Upon gentle abduction of the hip, push upward with the index finger and push toward the bed and laterally with the thumb. Finally, examine the baby's spine. Make sure there's no scoliosis by running a finger down the back. Spinal dysraphisms, such as tufts, Lipomas, hemangiomas, large dimples above the gluteal crease and anal verge need to be ruled out. Neurologic exam. The neurologic examination consists of a general screen as well as some reflexes that are specific to newborns. Observe the posture of the infant while lying supine. There should be flexion at the hips, knees, and elbows. In infants with hypotonia, the baby often assumes a frog leg position, where the hips are abducted with thighs resting on the bed. 
The level of alertness can be tested by tactile stimulation of the foot or cheek. The baby should awaken. Tone is best assessed by suspending the infant in a ventral position. In a baby with normal tone, the back should show some resistance to gravity. Lastly, primitive reflexes should be elicited. These include the plantar reflex, sucking reflex, moral reflex, gallant reflex, as well as the grasp reflexes. Conclusion. Routine physical examination takes only a few minutes and should be carried out in all infants at the earliest possible moment after birth, just before discharge from hospital and at regular intervals throughout the first few months of life. Routine physical examination excludes obvious abnormalities and helps make possible an earlier diagnosis of many not quite so obvious conditions.